the growth fell off a cliff. And it's still falling off a cliff. So he's absolutely right, <clears throat> Volker, when he said that. He's out, show me the only thing it did, the only thing it did is increase the risk in the system. That's it. And enriched people who in, were involved in this business, which is basically a casino type economy. All right? Look at this. In 1972, when the United States population was 200 million people, we built 2.6 million homes. And back then, the banks would uh, issue the mortgage, they would hold the mortgage, they would service the mortgage. It was a plain vanilla bank. The only thing the banks did back then in 1972 was lend people money. That's it. They didn't do derivatives, they didn't have prop desk trading or anything. We built 2.6 million homes. In 2006, at the height of the real estate bubble, when the U.S. population was 300 million, we added 100 million people, what happened? We built 2.6 million homes. What changed? Exactly the same. I'll tell you what changed. The financial sector had become unwieldy. A massive amount of intermediation was involved. It was no longer the bank making a mortgage to you. It was the bank making a mortgage to somebody, then that was sold to somebody else, and that was sold to somebody else, and then that thing was used as collateral for some other crazy thing. And at least if you said everybody in America had a house and they had a job, and they, you know, the, the general well, the promoting of the general welfare was taken care of, at least you could say it was worth it. But was it worth it? There's no way you could say it was worth it. The amount of productivity was exactly the same. However, we injected an enormous amount of risk. And we're going through the unwinding of that risk right now. And it's literally killing millions of people, including kids. In 2007, 40% of all corporate profits went to the financial sector. 40%, that's, it. that's an amazing, crazy number. For doing what? For basically redistributing the money in the economy. That's all it does. That's all Wall Street does. Does it build a road? Does it police your street? Does it put out fires? Does it educate your kids? Does it build a bridge? Does it create water and sewer system? It just moves the money around in the economy. And 40% of our gross domestic product went to that. Now you have to think, especially now again, when we hear all these complaints from people about the government and all they do is just redistribution. And they're taxing, which they're not, okay? But they say it. It's always a phony argument. But they say, it's redistribution, and it's not fair. Is this fair? This is the largest redistribution. And this is the vaunted, you know, we can't attack this, right? I mean, we can, the three of us, the four of us. But nobody pays attention. But you can't attack it. Why? Because it's the vaunted capitalistic system. It's the private sector. You gotta leave it alone because it knows what to do, okay? And the government is bad and it's terrible and it's horrible, but this is the capitalism at work. The private sector, you gotta leave it alone. It knows what to do. It knows what to do. Boy, it sure did, right? I mean, look at what it did. The US has the large, again, okay, did, what did we get out of it? Like, let's go back to that chart up there. What do we get out of it? Maybe you're right. Maybe I'm wrong. Look, I'm, I'm all about truth. As I said, I'm, an, I'm like, my thing is honesty. I hate labels, all right? People say to me, oh, you know, you're a Democrat, you're a Republican, you're a socialist, you're this, you're that. I hate labels. Labels are, are stupid, okay? It's for people who can't think. They, they have to compartmentalize everything into like a word, right? If you show me, if you could show me that all this was good and we came out of it somehow with some great results, I'll embrace it, man. You know, when I, when I met Warren Mosler, there's a funny story. I, I don't want to take up too much time. I know, you know we're under a time constraint here. I was invited to go to a Bloomberg seminar where Warren Mosler was speaking. 
And at that point, see, because I learned economics from all the wrong, and it's still wrong, okay? Uh, academic economics is just, it's just, it, it has no relevance. It's ridiculous. It's, it's ridiculous. But still, I learned it back in the 70s, and it was, it was already ridiculous then. But I remember up at that point when, and you know, I spent 10 years as a Fox business, as a Fox News contributor and then Fox business. And, you know, I used to spout all this stuff like we're broke and we're out of money and the dollar's going to collapse and who's going to buy, who's going to lend us money that, you know, all this wrong stuff. I was like, I had that in me. And I met Warren Molson and, you know, he's the most polite, patient guy. He's such a sweet guy. And I'm in this room. <laughs> and I got up, he's talking about, you know, imports are a benefit, exports are a cost, you know, all this stuff like that. And we could, and I'm like, what are you crazy? I got up, you don't know what you're talking about. I was rude to the guy. And he's such a nice guy and he was patient. And he was trying to show me and I, you know, but I went out of that, I went out of that seminar and I went home and something, it was like, you know, like a seed was planted in my head. And I started to think about all these things and I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I had it all wrong the whole time. This guy, he enlightened me. And you know what Warren said? To, we became great, great friends. We talk almost on a daily basis. He said, you know, once you learn that, Mike, your life will be miserable from now on. And he was absolutely right. And I blame him for that. Because it is miserable. Because every day I go through these fights with people, trying to show them, like, that's not reality, dude, what you're thinking there. This is the reality. You try to show them, but they're so... They're so locked into their dogma. Anyway, here we go. Wall Street, okay? The vaunted Wall Street. And I have, a, I have a personal story, by the way, about, I'll just run through this. Goldman Sachs, right? Remember the whole subprime fiasco. Goldman Sachs admits to fraud. They're like, yeah, we did it. You know, Bill's talking about stuff like the guys hide it, right? And, you know, smart guys like Bill, they see it. They pointed out, other people maybe, Goldman Sachs didn't even hide it. It's like, yeah, we did it, so what? And they get a little fine, right, for that. I think they paid 800 million for, for um, a trade. They made billions on these trades, right? They, they uh, you know, create some security that they, that was the Paulson trade, the John Paulson, this obscure money manager who was maybe managing like $100 million. Nobody ever heard of him for 40 years, okay? You had guys like George Soros and, and Tudor Jones and uh, Stanley Druckenmiller. These were like the, you know, the A-list of the hedge fund guys, the superstars. Who knew about John Paulson? Then John Paulson goes to Goldman Sachs and he says, I want you to create a security for me, an instrument that has the most, every single of the worst, shittiest, excuse me, you know, more loans and mortgages in there that you could pot that you know they're going to blow up. And I want you to go out and sell that, and I'm going to bet against that thing. It was a short thing. It was totally rigged, right? And that's exactly what Goldman Sachs did. They created that instrument for him. Then they went overseas to Germany and these little Landes banks and stuff like that. And they, um, they, sold, they told these people it was great, AAA rated, right? The thing blew up. That's how he made his $20 billion. I'm running out of time. I'm going to tell you a little personal five, five story. Five more minutes and I don't have to go, so you're doing well. You're doing well. Um, don't stop now. I'll, just, I'll end on a personal story. I worked for a short period of time, which was not included in my little bio there, at Standard & Poor's, okay? One of the enablers in this whole thing. In 2000, I worked at Standard & Poor's and I was in their structured finance division. That's the division that rated all of this crappy garbage, uh, this mortgage stuff. And I wrote a piece at the time about General Motors. General Motors stock in 2000 was trading at an all-time high of $80 a share. I wrote a negative analytical piece where I talked about these really way over the top rosy assumptions of, of uh, GMAC, their financing unit, about how they were expecting to make all this money on leases and stuff like that. And to me it seemed like the slightest little bump in the road, economically speaking, if the economy slowed down, because I'm an economist, I looked at it through that prism, this stuff is going to implode. So the chief auto analyst at S&P, this guy named Scott Sprinzen, he was furious at this thing that I wrote. And we got in this big argument, which eventually led to me 
being fired. I got fired, all right? I was allowed to resign, but let's call it what it was. It was a firing. Fast forward. General Motors goes bankrupt. The public has to bail it out, okay? I was fired. Scott Sprinson is still over there at his post at Standard & Poor's. And a few years later, I was over at Fox News, and I met um, Terry um, uh, McGraw, who is the uh, chief uh, CEO of uh, McGraw-Hill, which owns S&P. And I told him about that story. And he was like, oh, gee, that's too bad, Mike. <laughs> you know, so anyway, I had a little bit more, but um, I'll leave it over that to Lynn right now. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we'll go right on to Lynn Turner. Uh, Lynn Turner, to give you a drop of background, is currently the principal at a forensic accounting firm. He's held all kinds of jobs, but most important by 